Welcome this morning, everyone who's in the room and everyone who's online. And uh, Kids Men's Sunday, such a big deal to us. We love seeing lives influenced by grace at any age. But to think about a life influenced by age, by, at an early age, just shows what the trajectory of that life can be and all the ripple effects into uh, others' lives. So we're grateful. Uh, before I uh, do the teaching that I prepared this morning, I would like to just pray for you. So if you can just take a moment and, and bow your heads. And those of you who are um, joining us online, uh, you actually don't have to look at me on the screen right now. Just go ahead and bow your head. And let's open our hearts to see what God might do in us today. Father, uh, there is a great deal of tension in our country right now. And uh, we know there seems to be more fear than hope. Our political leaders may have great intentions, but they also have great temptations to appeal more to our fears than to our hope. I know in terms of politics, Tuesday is a really big day. You already know the outcome of that day. And you are not unsettled by it. I'm asking you to invest some of that peace into us, not just so that we feel better, but that we can be a resource of quiet confidence to those that we are around. Help others to feel calm in our presence because we have been in yours. Help others to feel hope about the future. And even though we don't know all the thoughts that you have towards us, we know they are good to give us a future and a hope. So today we breathe in your grace that enables us to speak grace, and we breathe in your peace, and that enables us to speak peace. Our faith is in you. Our hope is in you. Our confidence is in you. In Jesus' name. And all who agreed with that prayer said, Good morning, everyone. Thrilled that you're with us today. We're working our way through the uh, book of Acts, and we are in chapter 9. This is the 10th week that we spent together. Remember, we actually spent a couple weeks in, in, in chapter 8. And uh, so chapter 9, beginning verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether they be men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus who you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to a house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, 
The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent, sent, spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. It's a phenomenal story. A person who is a persecutor of the church becomes a missionary of the church. And it should give us hope for ourselves and for people in our world who we think are predisposed to discount anything of the working of God in their lives. Uh, First thing I want us to grasp this morning is that if we misunderstand God, we will misrepresent God. If we misunderstand God, we will misrepresent God. It, it's possible to be interested in spiritual things, but not be accurate. How many have ever heard this phrase, there's no such thing as a bad question? I've heard a couple that, but that might stretch the limits of that, and I can tell you sometimes there are bad answers, and, and, and sometimes people think, well, if it's a spiritual thought, it's automatically good. Not all thoughts are good, or not all thoughts are accurate. Saul is a very religious person, and he believes he loves God, but what he actually loves is the image that he has created of God, and it suits him. It matches his personality. This is a detail-oriented, rule-keeping individual who is able to, to impose his will to change a lot of things in his house and in his culture. And so he kind of wants to think that God is just a bigger, bolder, stronger image of himself. And the thing is, is that when you, when, when he falls in love with his image of God, he thinks that that means God has given him permission to ridicule others and to persecute others who don't agree with the image that he has of God. And he sees followers of Jesus as a huge threat to his image of what God is. I was recently challenged by an individual that one of the best things you can learn to do in life is, is to ask really good questions. Asking good questions is a better skill than giving good answers. And so I'm going to recommend three questions that we ask of God based on this passage. Three questions that are worth asking of God. First, it is better to ask God who he is than to tell him who he is. It is better to ask God who he is than to tell him who he is. See, our, we, we have two basic temptations. These, this kind of underscores a lot of our life. We are tempted to want to be like God, but we are also tempted to make the God we like. I've heard lots of... I was sitting... Uh, one time in a room and there was an individual who started telling me all the things that they believed about God and it was some really interesting information and I just asked him I said what is your source for those beliefs about God and he just made it up um, our temptation is to want to make God people have been doing this throughout him in history we make gods so how do you know if the God you're, you worship is, the, is a God of Scripture or is a God of your own making? And here's a really good test. If God has not said anything, and if God has not behaved in a way that in some way offended you, it is entirely possible that you have just made up your own God. The likelihood that you and God think exactly alike on all topics it's not good. <laughs> God is going to have some opinions that unsettle you. 
So God will not allow us to define him. We allow people to define us because we're insecure. We, we want people to approve of us. We want to fit in. We want to, we want to improve our social settings and circles. And so we will allow people to define us. God never allows that. We need a God that is bigger than our ideas and bigger than our imaginations. We need the true and the living God, not just a pretend one. That's a good place for an amen, I think. What do you think? Okay, a couple of you. That's great. God will not be defined by us. God will not be contained by us. God will not be controlled by us. God is actually God. Second really good question worth learning to ask. It's better to ask God who we are than to tell him who we want to be. Ask God who you are rather than just telling him who you want to be. See, God sees every aspect of our life, and by the way, he will show us things that we don't see in ourselves. And quite honestly, some of that may be something we would prefer not to see. We all have weaknesses that we would prefer we didn't notice and no one else did either. And by the way, we all have potential. And sometimes the idea of, of being called to live up to our potential seems overwhelming to us, and we would prefer not to know that either. The interesting thing about God is that he doesn't use the truth about us as an excuse to create distance from us. He uses that truth to help us pay attention to the areas where we can grow or where we can be healed. God addresses these areas of weakness and potential in our lives not to disown us, but to grow us. So this is another interesting thing. God is actually more interested in showing you something about yourself than he is in showing you something about the group of people you are around. There's no shortage of people who believe that God has shown them something about you. Um, if God hasn't shown me some stuff about me, I should probably be a little bit more quiet about the things I think. He has shown me about someone else. And God initiates these kinds of things. God always initiates. God always takes the first step. That's the nature of God. Jesus intercepted Saul, not the other way around. That's God's pattern. He goes first. If you're here this morning, you might not be a follower of Jesus. And if you're watching, you might not be a follower of Jesus. But I can tell you this. If you have any spiritual interest at all, you didn't initiate that idea. That somehow the God of heaven has begun to pierce through some of your thoughts and some of your ideas, and he's intriguing you. He's intersecting your life, and he wants to show you something about himself. So when Saul meets Jesus, he falls down from his horse, and he's unable to see I, there's something I want to point out here is that meeting Jesus does not cause blindness. Meeting Jesus reveals blindness. Saul was already blind to a lot of things. There's lots of things that we don't see. Personally, I, you've heard me say this many times, my superpower is oblivion. There's an O on my t-shirt under this. I mean, it's just, if there's ever a job for oblivion man, that's me. I, I can walk in and handle it. I don't notice a lot of things. But it's not just that. It's, there's a lot of things that are beyond our field of vision, a lot of things that are beyond our interest, a lot of things that are beyond our ability to see. Even in the spectrum of light, longer waves are infrared waves. We don't see them. Shorter waves are ultraviolet rays. We don't see them. But if you go out on a very sunny day, you can get a sunburn from rays of light you don't see. And lots of people say, well, if I don't see it, I, I don't believe it. If you can see the burned effects of that, we have to say something's going on. And there are lots of burned effects that are happening in people's lives that are not just ultraviolet rays. There's ultraviolet realities. There are spiritual things that are weighing in and emotional things that are weighing in on people's lives. And we can see the after effects of them. Our eyes need to be open. We're blind to that kind of thing. Third question. It's better to ask God to show us who others are than it is to define them by our fears or their worst moments. It is better. It is better to ask God who others are than to define them by 
our fears or their worst moments. Uh, Jesus comes to Ananias and says, I want you to go pray for somebody. Great. Who? Oh, it's in a house owned by this guy on a street called Straight. Great. Ready. Who? Well, he's a name. His name is Saul. He's from Tarsus. And, and this is where Ananias goes. Do you know who this guy is? He's done great harm to your holy people. He's come here with legal authority to do even more harm. And in that moment, all Ananias can see is who Saul was and what Saul had done. And he couldn't see who he could become. And God sees Saul very differently. He sees him, he, this is what he tells Ananias, this is my chosen vessel, and I'm going to use him to spread the good news to the Gentile kingdoms and to the Jews. See, our culture, we're not good at this. Our culture defines others immediately and permanently. Whatever you have said, whatever you have done, that's who you are. They'll troll through your social media accounts and they'll find the one thing they find offensive and that's their definition of you. And in our culture, if you've ever made a mistake, that outweighs any accomplishment you might have made. If you have ever said something in ignorance, that outweighs any wisdom that you could have gained or anything that you could have learned. Our culture believes that whoever you are, you cannot change. And I will tell you why. Because our culture has not changed. If you don't believe people can change, it's because you haven't. That's how it works. Saul got knocked down. By the way, being knocked down is not a conversion. Lots of us get knocked down. It doesn't necessarily open our eyes or our heart to God. Sometimes we, we think we learn some lessons from being knocked down. I've heard people say things like this. You've probably said something like this at some point in your life. We get knocked down because somebody betrayed us. By the way, that is one of the most devastating knockdowns you could ever have. You trusted a person, and they betrayed that trust, and now you feel like the, the ground underneath you has, has just become an open pit, and you're in a free fall into some kind of chaotic darkness, and you don't know what to make of it. And so we learn from that experience. I'll tell you what I learned, Pastor. You can't trust anybody. That's not true. And you won't get very far in life without the capacity to trust. Trust is the only way we have of seeing other people achieve their potential or seeing us move towards our future. We need trust. We can get knocked down and say, that's the last time I'm opening up my life to anybody again. You're not just closing your heart to hurt. You're closing your future. We can't live in isolated darkness and and accomplish what God has called us to. So getting knocked down is not a conversion experience, and, and becoming blind is not a conversion experience. Closing our eyes to, to things in life that we don't like. It happens to me. There's stuff that I'll, I'll be watching in a movie or on television. It, it's too much. And I just have to avert my eyes. I don't want to see it. My, my wife has, has missed half of a movie just because of that. She just looks away. This stuff in, in our house, there's only two rating systems. How many know there's, there's all kinds of rating systems? There's G, there's PG, or GP, PG, R, R17, um, not rated. Not rated is a, is a rating. That's in mature. Like the, there's so many. They've, they've almost accomplished every letter of the alphabet now. And, uh, but in our house, uh, Sue has two ratings. There's edifying and non-edifying. <laughs> and that's all it is. So just, just take that. So we can close our eyes, but here's what you need to know is our heart can't be open if our eyes are closed. There are things that we need to see 
even though we don't want to see them. So it is really good to ask God to show you who others are rather than to define them by your fears or their failures. Um, I just want to tell you a, a couple of insights I think that will help us in our journey regarding Jesus. And the first is this, Jesus fits in by not trying to fit in. Jesus fits in by not trying to fit in. Jesus didn't fit Saul's image of what a Messiah should look like, and Jesus didn't change for him. Uh, when Jesus walked the earth, he wore common clothes, he hung around common people, he used common language, common words. He never tried to use someone else to improve his position. He fit in by not trying to fit in. And secondly, Jesus proves himself by not trying to prove himself. He wasn't driven, he was just simply obedient. Sometimes he would teach the truth and the multitudes would come. And sometimes he would teach the truth and people would scatter. People would sometimes come to him and say, if you're who you say you are, prove it by doing this. He never took the bait. Jesus proved himself by not trying to prove himself. And Jesus showed preference by never showing preference. Jesus didn't show preference for one group over another. He didn't prefer religious people to secular people. He didn't prefer wealthy people to poor people. He didn't prefer educated people to uneducated people. He treated every single person with the dignity and respect that came from the recognition that they were created in the image and the likeness of God. Every single one of them. He could look beneath the sights and beyond the smells and he could see God's masterpiece. And I don't think we're good at that in our culture. That's what Jesus could do. People who were trapped by the deepest sins were actually attracted to Jesus, not because he ignored them. This is what our culture demands of us. They demand that you have to accept me as I am and don't try to change me in any way. And that's our definition of love. If, if you're not yet married and you're going to get married, or you think the possibility for you exists, do not look for a person who will never attempt to change anything about you. If your definition of love is that they will never try to change you, then what you're saying is that where you are is as good as you can be and you can never improve. Now, I won't ask you to raise your hands this morning because it could be, you know, you might want to plead the fifth on this one. But if you've been married, you've changed. Living with someone is different than living by yourself. Living with a spouse is different than living with a roommate. Living with a spouse is different than living with a roommate with benefits. Our culture thinks it's the same, but lots of people don't change in that environment. But you enter into a covenant of marriage, that's a very different thing. Change happens. Um, if you're ever diagnosed with a terminal illness, you'll notice something about people who are close to you. A lot of them will start creating distance. And it's not because they don't love you. It's that they don't know what to say. They're afraid they will actually add pain to your life. And so they keep distance because they don't want to hurt. And the wonderful thing about Jesus is whether we're hurting or we're healed, whether we're rich or we're poor, he doesn't prefer anyone over us or us over anyone, and he doesn't create distance. He stays present. Now, those three things, not fitting in by not trying to fit in, um, by but just learning how to... to prove yourself without trying to prove yourself, to, to not prefer one group over another, that in and of itself would be quite a defeating thing. And this message is not, so try to be more like that. Because we're not Jesus. There's one more insight about Jesus that I think will help us in that, and that is that Jesus saves others because he would not save himself. Until Saul could see Jesus as the sacrifice, 
he would keep demanding sacrifices of himself and other people. To Saul, sacrifices were made by people to God. He couldn't imagine that there was a God who would sacrifice himself for people. And if you're on the, I got to make the sacrifices or someone else has to make the sacrifices, you will always be an angry prosecutor of people who freely accept the grace of God. So Saul's praying, and God sends Ananias. So why didn't God just speak to Saul directly? And that's because Saul needs to be trained in community. Trying to impress other people is not real community. Trying to intimidate other people or find a group that you can is not real community. The only real currency, the only real currency left in this bankrupt culture of ours is what we share with each other when we're not trying to impress each other. That's real. That matters. Saul needs to be humble enough to receive gifts from someone who is not as educated or as revered as he is. He needs to see that God hears other people's prayers and God can use them too. So Jesus was knocked to the ground and no one picked him up. Darkness descended on him and he prayed and he did it all as a sacrifice for us. And recognizing that Jesus saves others by not saving himself takes the pressure off of us. And what we discover is Jesus just isn't, isn't a good example for us. He's our savior. And once you know you've been accepted by him, everything else starts to change. Let's bow our heads this morning. So what kind of questions are you asking God these days? And I would encourage you, ask God to show himself to you as he is, not as you would prefer. You, your life doesn't actually get better when you get your imaginations. Our life will be changed when we encounter the true and the living God. And ask God to show you the real you. Sometimes that's going to be hard to see. It breaks things in us, and that's okay. Because what's being broken is just the encrusted shale that has adapted itself to our lives and props up an image that's not real. The same God who shatters that image is the one that reveals the image and what he's created us to be. And, and ask God to reveal who others really are, not, not just your impression of what you've noticed. There's things you don't see. Maybe you're here today and, and you look at others and you think they are so confident. You have no idea what their struggle might be. Maybe you think others have so many friends. You have no idea how lonely some people might feel. You might look at someone and say, they may seem so righteous and you have no idea what their secret struggles might be. We need to see others as God sees them. They can be a chosen instrument of his too. They can be the ones who share good news to others because of what he does in their life. If we allow God to define others, all kinds of options become possible. So Father, help us today. Help us ask better questions and listen for your answers. In Jesus' name, amen.